So in this video, we're going to talk about how receptor tyrosine kinases are regulated and how they phosphorylate their substrates, which we have not introduced yet. Now, again, recall that receptor tyrosine kinases are typically also growth factor receptors. So on this cell here, I've drawn three growth factor receptors, and they're not binding growth factor. And so um, let's look at these growth factor receptors. Um, when cells are in G1 and there's no growth factor present, so no growth factor. And so you'll see I've drawn some of the domains of the growth factor receptor, which we covered in a previous video. You've got the ligand binding domain, which is extracellular, and there's not any ligand bound because there's no growth factors. And intracellular, you've got the tyrosine kinase domain, which um, will phosphorylate something maybe, or maybe not. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, and now I've written the word monomers, and that term will become clear very shortly. So when cells are in G1, there's no growth factor binding. These proteins exist as monomers. But when growth factors are present, we know growth factor binds growth factor receptor, that is going to change a characteristic of these proteins. And let me show you how. So now I've redrawn these growth factor receptors growth factor has bound them in the ligand binding domain. And now you'll see I've written high affinity. These two proteins have high affinity for one another. So first you have to remember the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. Proteins in the plasma membranes are not fixed. They are moving around. Um, so proteins can move in the plasma membrane. Then you have to remember that proteins can have affinity for one another. The 3D conformation of one protein and the 3D conformation of another protein could make it so that they have high, uh, high affinity for one another or low affinity for one another. So it turns out when growth factors bind growth factor receptors in that ligand binding domain, that changes the 3D conformation of these growth factor receptors. And so when they encounter one another now, then um, these receptors have high affinity for one another. So now they're binding each other with high affinity. So they form what we would call a dimer, right? So that's why I wrote monomers before, dimers now. So before these proteins, when they encountered one another in the absence of growth factor, they had low affinity for one another. So they would exist just floating in the plasma membrane as monomers. When growth factor binds growth factor receptors, changes the 3D conformation of the receptor, and now when they encounter each other, they have high affinity for one another. So they are binding each other with high affinity. So growth factor changes the affinity for, of receptors for one another. So monomers versus dimers. So that's, that's what growth factor does. It binds and triggers dimerization of growth factors. Dimerization, a very important term. Okay, well, this receptor is also a kinase. And guess what? This binding, this receptor binding, the growth factor receptor binding, growth factor binding growth factor receptor, and the dimerization also triggers a change to the kinase activity. So the kinase, let me move a little bit out here, there, there's this region, there's this domain of these growth factor receptors, the tyrosine kinase domain. When these receptors are in their monomeric form, so they're monomers, they bind, bouncing off each other, the growth factor is not present, they're in such a three-dimensional conformation that they have very low kinase activity. If they encountered their substrate, probably wouldn't phosphorylate it very much. Whereas when the dimers form, so dimerization of receptors plays a role in activating the activity of the kinase, increasing the activity, I should say, of the kinase. So receptor binds ligand, the growth factor, changes the 3D conformation of these receptors. They bind each other. The kinase domains become highly active. So they will now grab ATP, plug off of the phosphate, and transfer phosphate to their substrates, which I have not said what the substrates are yet. I'm about to tell you, and I've been hesitant because this can be this gets a little confusing. People get confused with, about this part here, and that's okay, because it is confusing, but it hopefully will make sense to you shortly, and we'll see lots of examples. We'll learn lots of examples of um, and implications of what's about to happen now. It's okay. So, so now that these receptors are dimerized, 
and the kinase domain is now active, the kinases get a phosphorylated substrate, right? So these are tyrosine kinases, and they will phosphorylate tyrosines on their substrates. So I'm going to draw a bunch of tyrosines. One letter abbreviation for tyrosine. And you'll see where, I have, where I've uh, drawn the tyrosines in the uh, protein sequence of the receptors, right? Those cytoplasmic tails have a number of tyrosines in them. So that's kind of weird. Well, let's see what happens now. Let's say that um, receptor that binds ATP, it's going to pluck off the phosphate, and it's going to transfer it to its substrate. Where did it transfer it to? It transferred it to a tyrosine in the other receptor. Let's go do it again. Grab another ATP, transfer the phosphate to the other receptor, a tyrosine on it. Let's go do it again. All right. So what's happening here? It's kind of weird. The one receptor is going to phosphorylate the other receptor. So what you have here is not just phosphorylation, but transphosphorylation. Because why do we call it transphosphorylation? It's because you have a kinase over here and you have a kinase over here and they're brought close to one another. And when they're brought close to one another and they're active, this kinase will phosphorylate that kinase and this kinase will phosphorylate that kinase. So you have a, not just phosphorylation, but transphosphorylation, two kinases dimerizing and then phosphorylating one another. So some people are a little, a little confused, a little overwhelmed by this, that's okay. But when we talk about kinases and their substrates, this is a little odd because the substrate for a receptor tyrosine kinase is the other receptor tyrosine kinase in the dimer pair. We're gonna see a whole lot of examples of this in real life, in research. So um, this is called transphosphorylation. So it's not just regular phosphorylation, but transphosphorylation. Some papers refer to this as autophosphorylation because a kinase, it's not phosphorylating, kinase isn't phosphorylating itself, it's phosphorylating its partner, which looks just like itself, right? Remember, one of these receptors and the other receptors, they're binding each other, and these receptors are identical to one another. They can be identical. And we'll see an example of that here shortly. So, if you look at the receptor before growth factor binding, what you will see is that those tyrosines, are they phosphorylated? Well, is the kinase active? No, kinase is very, has a very low activity. So the, the tyrosines in those tails are not phosphorylated. So why, why are we learning about this? Well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal here is that you have a signal that started outside the cell. You have growth factor, binding growth factor receptor. That has changed something inside the cell. So something outside the cell affected something inside the cell. Growth factors, bound growth factor receptors outside the cell, cause them to change their shape, dimerize, transphosphorylate. And now you have a bunch of these phosphate, phosphate groups attached to these tyrosines inside the cell. That is huge. It's going to send a signal, it's a cascade into the cell all the way to the nucleus. We'll see that later in a lot of videos. How that gets the cell to go from G1 phase to S phase. All right, let's uh, let's see an example of this. We learned about a number of different growth factors and growth factor receptors. So here's an example: PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor. Right? It's a growth factor present inside platelets, and we know what this growth factor binds. It binds growth factor receptors. So the PGDF receptor that is found on the surface of a number of cells. And I've given you two examples here, endothelial cells and fibroblasts. And now instead of drawing one receptor per cell, I have drawn four receptors per cell. And I've got a little bit of a little bit more detail into the receptors. There's, a, there's some tyrosines in the tail and uh, there's the kinase domain. And I've also drawn them spread out over the surface of the cell. So how would you describe the receptors when there is no growth factor present, All right? There are a number of different characteristics. I might have to move out of the way for this one. So are they monomers or dimers? 
They're monomers. They're, if they hit each other, they have low affinity for one another. The kinase domain, that little purple part, is it highly active or not very active? It's not very active. It's very low kinase activity. So if they run into each other, not going to phosphorylate each other. So those tyrosines, do they look phosphorylated? They are not phosphorylated. Right? There we go. So right now in your body, your endothelial cells and your fibroblasts, if they're just sitting there in G1, it's because there's no growth factor, no PDGF in the area. And these receptors are monomers. They're maybe bouncing off each other, low affinity. And cells are just happy in G1. Tyrosine's not phosphorylated. Let's say you've got some tissue damage. So your platelets activate. They release growth factor. So we need more cells. That's why the growth factor is released. We need more cells. So what's going to happen to the receptor? So maybe this is a good opportunity to pause the video and draw what these two cells would look like when we add growth factor. So you can pause it and come back and check. All right, hopefully you've drawn it and come back and checked. And so now you'll see how I drew them. So again, these are PDGF receptors. So growth factor has bound them. And now you can see I've drawn them as dimers, not monomers. So they have a high affinity for one another, so I draw them next to each other. The kinase, uh, is now highly active, the kinase region, the kinase domain, that tyrosine kinase domain. And you'll see that the tyrosines inside the receptors in the, in the cytoplasmic tail are phosphorylated. How they get phosphorylated? The other receptor added a phosphate group to it. Right, so you have transphosphorylation. And again, why are we learning about this? Well, because this is how cells know that it's time to go to S phase. This is one major way that cells are told by other cells, by growth factors, right? This is cell-to-cell -cell communication. The platelets are communicating to endothelial and fibroblasts. We need more cells. And how does that occur? Growth factors binding growth factor receptors, receptors dimerizing, leading to phosphorylation of the tyrosines in the cytoplasmic tail. And we'll see how that signal gets sent all the way to the nucleus to tell the cell to go into S phase.